All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Karen Hurt, who is over on the East Coast in Maryland. How are you doing, Karen? I'm great. How are you? Excellent, excellent. Karen's an author, international keynote speaker, um, particularly focused on transformational change. And she was recently named Inc.'s list of most innovative leadership speakers and American Management Association's 50 Leaders to Watch. And you help leaders around the world achieve breakthrough results without losing their souls, which is always a good thing. You need to hang on to your soul, right? And uh, today we're going to talk about courageous cultures. So Karen, getting straight into it, when you, when you use the term courageous culture, what do you mean? Yeah, so our favorite definition of culture is comes from Seth Godin, the marketing guru, who says, mm -hmm. people like us do things like this. So in a courageous culture, people like us speak up. They share their ideas. They solve problems. They advocate for the customer. The, the default is to contribute, and silence isn't safe, and effort is everything. Mm -hmm. Great. So, I mean, obviously, that's a... Um you know, there's a lot of companies, you know, who have evolved over time and that's not the pervasive culture, shall we say. So if you're, in, if you're a leader or somebody in, 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 who has influence in an organization like that and you want to start to transition into being a more courageous culture, what are some of the, what are some of the first steps you need to take? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, in our research, there were a couple of things that came up. You know, people said the 49% of the research respondents said the reason they don't speak up is that no one asks. Mm. And 50% said the reason they don't speak up is because nothing will ever happen. Their idea won't be taken seriously. So that's where I would start. So you know, first, it really starts with navigating your own narrative around this. Are you willing to speak up? Because if you're telling your team, hey, yeah, contribute, but they're watching you not share an idea, not advocate for their ideas, not stand up for a peer, they're going to watch what you're doing versus what you're saying. Then it comes, the next step is really clarity, which is clarity around two things. One being absolutely crystal clear that you do want people's ideas. And that's more than, oh, I have an open door. Because mm -hmm. for, you know, for many people, it still takes courage to go through that open door. And then clarity around what a good idea would accomplish. Right. Do people understand enough about where you are headed as an organization to bring you the right kinds of ideas? Mm -hmm. And then from there, it's cultivating the curiosity, going out and deliberately asking people for their ideas. And we have a number of tools that we outline in the book about how to do that well and then respond with regard, letting people know what happened with those ideas. You know, so that's really where I would start. Yeah, no, I think that's a great place. And I love the idea of uh, asking, uh, the, the, you know, that your respondent said that nobody ever asked them. So that's a pretty simple place to start, isn't it? Just to start asking people for their input. And, and then, as you say, helping them to understand what a good idea looks like. Because let's face it, sometimes if you ask people for input and they give it, um, like you said, and it's not and it's not implemented or it's not taken on board. They get very disheartened. But not every idea is a good idea. So you kind of have right. to set the stage first to say, like, you know, we'll take ideas on board and everything. But if your idea doesn't progress, it's not because it was a bad idea. Maybe it's just not the right one for the right time. Yeah, so there's two ways to think about that. One is we have what we call, and we teach in our trainings, this idea model. And so when you say, when you're bringing us an idea, tell us I, why is it interesting? I mean, why is it strategically aligned with where we're headed right now? D, is it doable? Is it something we could actually pull off and tell us why? That's particularly important right now mm -hmm. because people already have too much. Um, yeah. E, is it engaging? Meaning who are the key stakeholders? Who else would think it's a good idea? And A, what would you recommend are a couple neat next steps, like really positive next steps. And so when you can teach people, when you're bringing the idea, run it through this model, it helps people to bring you better ideas, not just have faked ideas. Right. And then on the flip side, when you're responding, whether an idea is a good idea or one you can't use, you can always respond in three ways. First, with gratitude, thanking mm -hmm. them for contributing, information, letting them know what is going to happen or not happen with the idea, and then I, an invitation to continue to invite. 
So for example, if you have somebody who brings you an idea, you're, you know it's not gonna move forward because it's not where you're headed. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you caring about the business. Information, we're not going to implement that now because this idea would take us in that direction and we're actually headed in this direction. An invitation. Do you have any ideas that might help us there? Mm. Right? And so people still feel heard even if their idea isn't being used. Yeah, no, I think those are those are great. Those are great pointers. So, you know, gratitude, information and invitation. So you what you obviously what you want to do is you want people to feel appreciated. You want them to understand why maybe their ideas and going forward. But you certainly want them to continue to con feel like they can continue to contribute ideas. Right. Yeah. So what do you mean by I, I see one of the chapters in your book is navigate the narrative. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so it was interesting. So as we were doing, so we did a, a, a large quantitative study and then also a qualitative study to get underneath mm -hmm. what people's fears were and what was preventing them from speaking up. And what we found is that the ideas that people were holding back weren't trivial. They were, they were like, they weren't like ideas for, oh, you know, put a foosball table in the break room or, yeah. you know, virtual tacos for everybody. It was ideas to improve the customer experience, the employee experience. Um, or a productivity and a process. So ideas you really want. But what we found when we asked people why they didn't contribute those, 40% said, I lack the confidence to share my ideas, meaning mm -hmm. I'm scared. And as we dug into this, and we also, uh, Dr. Amy Edmondson of Harvard, uh, who wrote the Fearless Organization, she's uh, also a pioneer of psychological safety. She, yeah. you know, she talks about how people are most likely to hold on to a negative experience than a positive experience. Sure. So that means that even if you are a great, fantastic leader listening to people, it's still possible that somebody is holding on to a negative experience they had in the past where they spoke up, they got in trouble, mm -hmm. or they were bullied, or they were shamed or intimidated. And they're like, you know what? I'm not going there again. It's easier yeah. to just be quiet. And so part of that is, you know, navigating your narrative and help understanding your team's narrative around speaking up. Like what, what's the scar tissue? Uh, a real specific example about how we've been doing this recently. So since COVID, right, people are under so much stress. And mm -hmm. so one of the things that we've been going in and doing before we do any live online Courageous Cultures program is we will ask people to anonymously share their biggest hopes and fears for the next 18 months. And then we pull those in and then we begin the program and saying, here, here are the themes that emerged around that. Because anything that you're teaching, if people are sitting in all that fear, if we don't talk about that, we just start training and doing, you know, they're, like, eh, they're, they're tuning out. But if people say, oh, wow, I'm not alone. Other people are scared about this too. Let's talk about that. And let's talk about how we're going to apply anything else we're doing in this landscape. And that all is part of navigating the narrative. Yeah, no, I love that. And, and uh, Amy Edmondson has been a guest here and she's oh. contributed to some other um, like panel events that we've done and obviously you know, has got tremendous insight to so yeah. say, but I really like what you talk about there because I do think people sometimes overlook the fact that they personally carry baggage and that other people carry baggage and you never know what that baggage is, right? And you never know where it comes from. Um, right. And therefore just asking people to say, hey, you know, everybody will welcome everybody's ideas and all of that. Um, it, you're, you're overlooking the fact that yes, you may have put it out there, but there may be other things preventing people from putting forward their ideas. So you need to nurture that almost over time. Yes. Yeah. So um, cultivate curiosity, right? I mean, we talked a little bit about you, obviously you have to create the clarity, which is one of your chapters, but cultivating curiosity. Um, talk a little bit about, about that because some people would say you're either naturally curious or you're not. So how can you cultivate curiosity among your team? Yeah, so it can start very simply. And one of the simplest techniques we talk about is asking courageous questions. Mm -hmm. And a courageous question differs from a general, how can we do better question in two ways. It's specific and it's vulnerable. So it's specific in the fact that you are only asking for one thing. So for example, right. Don Yeager, of, uh, he runs a contact center organization called Mural. And we talk about him in the book. He consistently goes out and asks the people who are on the phones, what is one policy we have that just sucks? 
Right. So he's only asking he's only asking for one, which makes it easy, lowers the friction. Mm -hmm. But he's also assuming it's vulnerable. He's assuming, even though he's created the policies, right? Yeah, he's yeah. assuming that there are policies that are ticking off his customers, and he wants to know what those are. And so, you know, then it makes once you start there, then it's easy to say, "Thank you so much." What else, right? Because mm -hmm. now you're in a dialogue, or you right. could say, you know, what's one thing that could sabotage the success of this project. So I'm assuming there's something that's going to get in the way. And so now I'm making it easy for people to raise their objections. So that's one example of um, cultivating curiosity. Um, another is, uh, I loved this, uh, this example. So my sister is the director of rehab at Wellspan Hospital. And I was okay. telling her about our research and some of the tools and she said, Karen, I think we do this. And I said, all right, what do you do? I probably put it in the book. And she said, we, um, when we have an important decision to make or we're implementing something new, we always ask one person in the meeting to act on behalf of the patient. So mm -hmm. for example, if Joe is normally the director of IT. In that meeting, he's not allowed to talk IT stuff. He is only right. allowed to be sitting there thinking about what would he be thinking about if he were the patient. So they were implementing a new scheduling system. And it was the idea that this was trying to solve was my sister Jill, she would go in to send her team in to do rehab. They'd find an empty room because the patient was off in testing. So they were trying to get better coordination across right. the hospital. So the patient, Joe from IT, is sitting there listening to this and he says, I want to know my schedule too. And she mm -hmm. said, oh, I went, oh no, <laughs> that's going to be, he's like, no, 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 I get it. This is a hospital, you know, you're not gonna get it 100% right, there are going to be emergencies, but even if it's 80% right, I already feel so out of control, I have cancer. Can you imagine if I could know, my wife could be home with our kids some of the time, not have to feel like she has to be here all the time. So they did, because of that curiosity, they yeah. then implemented transparent scheduling. And she said, it's not perfect, but the patient experience has transformed so much. Their satisfaction scores have gone up considerably. So oh, you, know, you can do that in any, you, who have somebody act on behalf of the patient, uh, a customer, have somebody act on behalf of the other department, right? Of, of a merged organization that you're merging with, of the company you're acquiring. But just getting that perspective sitting there in the meeting which is yeah, different is than just idea. asking everybody, oh, what do you think our customers would think about this? Yeah, no, I think that's such a great idea. And that's such a great, con what, you, what your sister's organization did. What a great concept, because it was just reminded me of, of um, you know, even recently, you know, having to spend some time in a hospital with a family member. And it's like, you know, when, when's the doctor come around? Oh, there sometime this morning. Right. You know, and, and so, you know, you have no idea, is that like in 10 minutes or is it like in three hours, whatever. But yeah. I, I love that. But yeah, I like that idea in a, any organization because it is, it is a fascinating thing of human nature is that we're all, we're all buyers and we're all consumers and we're all customers. But then sometimes when we walk through the door of our own organization, we suddenly get this collective amnesia and we forget about our own experiences and we don't yes. think about how things are received on the other end. So I really... I love, I love that idea. And then when you say, what's it, practice the principle? That's a really interesting one. Yeah, so one of the things that, and you've probably experienced this, somebody, you know, some executive discovers a great best practice and says, <laughs> everybody needs to do this now. And you know, mm -hmm. they, like, there's this mandate and this emergency, everybody's adopting it. And the truth is it was a good best practice for that particular space, market. Right customer base, mm -hmm. right? And um, sometimes you need to take a step back and say, what is the principle behind the best practice here? And so, you know, okay, we need to treat our customers with empathy. Well, the way they're going to do that in West Virginia may mm -hmm. look different the way they're going to do that in the Philippines. And right. so the principle is we're going to treat our customers with empathy. We're going to tap into local best practices to make that happen, but mm -hmm. we're not going to have everybody implement what happened in West Virginia and in, in Asia, you know? Right. And, um, and so there is an example in the book from a, a case study when I was at, uh, for my sales, I was leading 2200% sales team at Verizon and we took a principle but implemented it differently across every market. 
Um, and that was really what caused the breakthrough and success. Yeah, no, and I think that's a great concept because yes, you're right. Sometimes we just think that if something's a really good idea, it should work absolutely everywhere and in every single circumstance. And that's yeah. just not the, it's not the way life works. Um, and then you talk about building and, and building an infrastructure for courage. Yeah, so this is really where you are figuring out, are your HR systems and processes working for you or against you mm -hmm. in building a, 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 um, an organization where people really do speak up and share their ideas? So for example, if you're in a stack, if you're stack ranking your sales team constantly, right, and then putting, making that very visible, and you want people to share their best practices, but they feel like they're in internal competition, with their, that, that could be a problem. Another example is onboarding. So when we talk about clarity and curiosity, most folks, when they are onboarding new people, it's all about the clarity. This is how we do things around here. Mm -hmm. Here's our mission statement. Here's our values. They're missing the huge opportunity. You've got somebody who's just walked in, probably from a competitor, with yeah. best practices. So to start from day one of someone to be perfectly clear that you really do value their ideas and make space in your onboarding to get those ideas you know, even if you're just setting it up and saying, I know it's been a lot, I'm going to come back in a week and I'm going to ask you for your ideas. And so that you, you're then reinforcing two things. You really are serious about it and you're getting the ideas right up front. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great idea and, I, and a great concept because I do think uh, you have to look at your systems absolutely and make sure because, I mean, we live nowadays with a digital process this is and a digital economy where you need technology um, but you need it to work for you and you need right. to make sure that it works for you and you also need to know that it's not going to solve the human problems that you have you need to do right. that first right? right technology is not going to do it on, on your behalf so um, one last thing then you talk about how to leverage uh, diverse talent and you know and, and people being different and i think that's a always a key one because I think sometimes people have one communication style and it works fantastic for a type of person or maybe a subgroup of people, but doesn't work for others. And sometimes people find it hard to modify or have a different communication style for different groups. Yeah. And it's even harder now uh, mm -hmm. with everyone, you know, so many people working remotely. Sure. So, you know, this is thinking about, all right, what do you do with your silent ponderous types? You're the person who sits in the meeting and they really are thinking about ideas, but the extroverts mm -hmm. are talking right over them. And by the time they, they've got their thoughts fully formed, which by the way, they're may, way more formed probably than what the extroverts sure. are shooting out. You're moved on to the next thing or they can't even get your attention on the Zoom call. Right? So, or you've got someone who I call the idea, we call the idea grenadiers. And these are the people who just lobbying ideas after ideas at you and they, they're not thinking them through right mm -hmm. you know so what do you do with someone like that you know how do you get them to slow down maybe teach them the idea model say hey bring all right take your 17 ideas run them through this model bring me your best one you know right um or, or what do you do with someone we call the silent wounded and this is you know somebody who has been hurt in the past and mm -hmm. i know that i went in my time at verizon i had a woman like that who worked with me and i'm I'm like, what did I, did I ever do this? You're like, what did I do that's shutting you down? She's like, it's not you, but I, I've got so much scar tissue from old jobs, I'm just not, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that, that, and that took a lot of extra effort and work, but we finally got her there. So being sensitive to who is on your team and then how do you approach each person differently? How do you set up your meetings in a way that you can get the input, some of the input in advance so that people have time to think? How do you use some of the technology? Zoom breakout rooms are your friend right now. Yeah. You know, rather than trying to have 10 people on a call, break people into groups of three or four to think about issues, you know, all that. On top of yeah. all the other, you know, the diversity and inclusion sure. work that so many are doing right now. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, because they're using Zoom breakout rooms and that it's a great way of because you can actually cherry pick, if you like, and put people together who you think, OK, these people probably haven't worked or collaborated before. And it'll be an interesting dynamic to see them yes. um, experiencing each other. And actually, it's funny because I, I, we've been doing this a long time because we've been running a largely virtual company for, for many, many years. From, from a, we did that out of a strategic decision, which obviously worked out in our favor in recent time. But it is interesting that 
oftentimes like the people who are the extroverts in meet in physical meetings you know and they have to come in and dominate a room they don't always that doesn't always translate translate to zoom and in some ways sometimes or, or virtual sometimes the actual introverts feel somewhat more comfortable in the virtual environment so it, it, you, you get an interesting dynamic going on where sometimes you get the, the toned down a little bit and these people speaking up a bit. So It is true, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, listen, Karen, this has been great. So the book is called Courageous Cultures. Um, all of Karen's information plus links to all of the books uh, will be in the contributor bio. But before we go, please do tell us a little bit more about yourself and your organization. Oh, so uh, yeah, I'm the CEO of Let's Grow Leaders, and uh, we do leadership development programs uh, all over the world. Uh, we are known for our very practical tools and techniques. It's not just theory, uh, all grounded, not only in research, but in having both of us been uh, executives for many, many mm -hmm. years before starting this. So um, we'd love to, so you can reach us at letsgrowleaders.com, uh, and we'd love to connect. Yeah, listen, thanks again, Karen, some great insights there. And as you can tell, all very practical. So I'd encourage you to check out the book as well. I mean, this is the time when, you know, coming, there are so many opportunities as we emerge from this to, to kind of reorient your organization, to try some new things. There's never been a better time, to be honest, to, to be a little bit more creative and maybe bold in your approach. So I would definitely encourage you to look at things like Courageous Culture and see if there's things that you could implement yourself. All right, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.